I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to introduce the other people that are in this conversation. My name is Soledad Gutierrez and I'm creator at TBA21. And I'm talking today with Himali Singh Soin, artist, and David Soin Tapasa, that is uh, a musician and that has been part of this creative process we are sharing today. And the stage is the short name from the Screaming Age. And it's a project that has been born throughout this lockdown to the COVID crisis period and that has been very much connected to the conversations the three of us have had throughout this time, before this time, and also we have served with Francesca Thyssen Bordemisa, who is the editor-in-chief of this stage and has been an integral part of these conversations. We have started talking with Himali and David that wasn't in those conversations, but that was part of the integral project, like late 2019, because we were preparing a performance that was meant to happen in 2019, in, oh, sorry, in the 7th of May of 2020. And funnily enough, the world in a way changed. COVID came to our lives and the museums were closed. And we were about to send an email to Himali saying, we are not able to host the performance. And we decided that we, we didn't want to send that email, that we really wanted to carry on this conversation with Himali, that we wanted to find a way to that work to be presented, and that we wanted to continue the conversation on the digital space. And that space, we didn't know it was going to be this. We are kind of presenting now, we are taking advantage of that it's the stage. So basically, in the beginning, we thought about streaming a performance. We thought about doing something we didn't know what. And as the more we talk, the more we realize that we needed to create a place, a space, a digital space where the works could be presented together with a series of materials that would help to contextualize, to situate that knowledge that like it's really important. And then also that would give a different entry points to the different publics that with this digital scope we are also aiming to reach. So we are presenting a series of audio pieces that we will talk about them in, in a second that will be or will be um, surrounded by other materials that we will be unfolding throughout this conversation. One of them is a podcast that will that has been conducted by Sky Arundati Thomas. The other one is this conversation we are having now. Then we will have a call for action that we will explain also later. And we will also serve like a research library where we will be able to find like different elements that have been really important for the process of construction of these pieces. This conversation before getting into detail, I was thinking, or maybe I was going to propose to both of you a title that it's on quickness. And it's because a chapter that has of Ital, of Italo Calvino's six memos for the next millennium that has been present in many of our conversations. And that deals with many aspects that I think that are really important to the pieces we are presenting at this stage. First of all, he deals with many literary references. And in a way, these audio pieces, these experimental sound chapters, as I very much like how you describe them, Himali, are or depart, come from a poem book that you are just presenting now. So if you could explain that to us, it would be fantastic. Uh, that Calvino chapter on quickness, I always think of that one tone that he uses. He says, hurry slowly, hurry slowly. And I really like that because it was this moment of pause, of course, for the whole world. For some people, um, a very different pause, uh, perhaps an unwanted pause. Um, but the idea of hurry slowly being also that we can find a pace within a pace, 
and subcontinental begins with this idea of rest actually so um for me that poem was really important it was also the first little zine that i made before the the book at large the book just to backtrack is a collection of uh, alchemies it's from the perspective of ice of an archive that is being lost an elder that has been stripped of its language and so i intervene in histories and histories that have been both lost but also possibly never even discovered um so there are love letters there are recipes there are formulas there are um potions for witchcraft there are biographies of lost women in the polar imaginary and uh so the the kind of the collection is like an almanac it's something like an explorer's diary that is taken and it's a it's a combination of scientific observations and completely mystical magical solutions to no problems um so yeah so i chose uh, these three poems one is called subcontinentment one is called antarctica was a queer race before it got busted by colonial white parts and another one is called lady antigua um and they were just the first three that that struck me for various reasons that we we'll possibly go into right now well, i mean it's, it would be great if you kind of tell us that no because i always think about the power of edition and how much we have been conditioned by this time and all the conversations so i guess that's there are reasons for all those poems to be chosen and it would be great like kind of to so um subcontinentment was it was kind of a south asian futurism manifesto as it began but i very quickly realized when i wrote the words that south asian is to large a place and futurism harks back to the violence of a european futurism and a manifesto should be always changing so even as i wrote south asian futurism manifesto it fell apart immediately but the idea came from finding myself in the arctic in the antarctic as a brown woman thinking what am i doing here this cannot be more of an alien place than anywhere that my body or my mind could know or ever be in and slowly i started discovering there were much many more links than i ever imagined the arctic and the antarctic are intimately connected with a place like india where i am from from on one uh, level they're connected via something called a teleconnection so i was kind of i was in this silver space blanket also reflecting the idea that the poles are used for outer space research programs and i suddenly thought that there's this kind of south asian entanglement and there's this futurism that has to do with outer space and thinking around futurity and um, that's how this whole piece came about but the reason for choosing south the subcontinentment at this moment Uh, subcontinentment is the term i give to south asian futurism is because um solidar we chose these pieces right after india went through a period of intense protest protest against an anti muslim bill that was introduced and we had experienced a period of intense sociality being in close proximity to other bodies really feeling our agency as people and as a democracy to be something even in a in an environment where one is being silenced and so subcontinentment david started recording the azan which is the muslim prayer in the evenings and it and it was resounding the sounds from the mosque and the sounds from the temple suddenly you could hear them so clearly because you couldn't hear the horns blaring you couldn't hear the cows and the vegetable vendors and this felt really emotional and important to us to blend the arctic sounds with these sounds and so that was the reason for choosing subcontinent because one of the things we have spoken about a lot when we you were producing this play i mean this piece was the orland landscape no like how much the actual city has changed and how 
the relationship, as you were saying, no? like those bodies were becoming different agents within that scenario. I don't know if that has also something to do with the music and how it's connected, because also there is references of sounds coming from your expeditions. No, it's a mix, they are entangled. Yeah, so, I mean, it was very interesting, I guess, as a process, because we had, well, what, what I, I work mostly on, on the, the sound bit that's in the background of the text. Uh, and uh, so on, on the one hand, uh, I had this archive of Arctic sounds that Himali had brought with her uh, from her expeditions um, and uh, that I worked with uh, as an inspiration and actually as actual sound matter. Uh, and then there was this whole idea of South Asia. But um, I feel this idea of, a, of an Indian city soundscape is so omnipresent that you hardly realize it uh, in your everyday life. Um, but because there was a sudden rupture of social life, there was all these sounds that disappeared and you started missing all these sounds that you suddenly noticed that had always been there, but you were never aware of. All these bird sounds were suddenly there. All these uh, mosques and temples that normally get uh, drowned out by, by traffic noise suddenly appear. Uh, or simple things, um, one, one of the, the, the bass sounds we used for that piece for that sound of the, of the ceiling fan, uh, which for me is, is such, a, such a dead sound in a way, whenever you're in Delhi and you sleep and there's a ceiling fan that's on the whole time. And the, the, the feeling of rest that comes with the fan. The fan is just on and it's hot and it kind of blows the hot wind and it lulls you in the state of what subcontinent wants to propose as a kind of contentment, a new contentment. Hmm. And, and uh, the, the other aspect of it was, uh, I mean, what Imali talked about uh, before, these this invisible connections or connections we may not be aware of between uh, the uh, South Asian subcontinent uh, and, uh, and the Arctic. Um, and, uh, we deliberately tried to use some sounds that could have been from either place or one sound that that is from South Asia, but sounds more Arctic or other sounds that that are Arctic, but actually sound South Asian to to kind of create this sort of melting pot. And that's that's really beautiful no? because it's like also like those tricks of the narrator that it's very much in the transmission and in that oral landscape or that oral stories that are very much connected to kind of the writing that go back to uh, Calvino. And there was like kind of this idea of transmission that it's really important. I don't know if you want to kind of relate to that and how you feel that's part of the role of the musician, the artist, but it's an integral part of your work. Yeah, I think maybe uh, on the heels of, of saying something like, we now live in societies where everything cannot be spoken out loud. So the idea of transmission then means that you are subverting a popular narrative and you're stitching, it's the false stitch. So you're leaving behind codes for you and you and you to interpret between. And a large and important part of this process of for my and our artistic practice in general, I think, is to create something like an open text that every work, whether it's textual or not, must be open so that it can have multiple entry points and it can uh, be infinitely interpretable. And in that, it's a democratic piece that I don't tell you everything. And where you enter into the piece, then it becomes yours. And I think that's also why I chose these three pieces, that they, they speak to different bodies. Antarctica is a queer ray, speaks to different beings, different bodies, different voices. Um, it speaks to the imaginary of fetishism, something that we're doing with the virus itself. It's become this other, this microbe that is so alien to us that we will never learn how to look it in its face and understand it. 
or learn from it or try to hear it, listen to it. Um, similarly with Lady Antigua, the transmissions were between many layers of history. Who was this? Who is this lady, this black lady on the bow of the boat? Um, between mysticism and, and, and a kind of slave of the past. And so those histories now meet the current time in Black Lives Matter. And in between are these transmissions. So mm. But I think, yeah, one aspect which you mentioned, which, which is very important, is to create this openness. And I think that's one uh, reason for our choice of media as well, to really concentrate on that oral aspect and the aspect of listening. Um, because so often, actually, uh, when you have something concretely uh, visual, your imagination almost gets limited by, by the visual input. And if you just have a, an oral like soundscape or, or a narration, uh, closing your eyes, it, it opens it up so much more to the listener to, to create their own imagery to it and to kind of delve into the text in a different and possibly much deeper way. I had asked David once, don't you feel guilty playing jazz? That, what, is, what does it do? And he thought for a long time and he didn't reply. And then later he said, I listen. And it's been really interesting to see, even in this Black Lives Matter protest, that people have been um, harking back to James Baldwin, to Martin Luther, many of whom who said in the past, also harkening back possibly to a history of jazz, to listen. That part of being an activist is to listen. And that's a position in the world, no? because it's a really, I mean, listening, it's really difficult. We haven't been taught very much how to listen or you know, to give a space or a mind a space, you no? Know? because this is one of the conversations that is rooted in this kind of reference to the sound is the fact that sometimes we felt they kind of, it would be nice to have an image that goes together with the sound. So there is like a visual relationship to it. And it's true that this deep listening, it's a difficult attitude because it's a way of humbleness in terms of like being able to open your body and connect, I guess, with something that we have been also, and um, you were talking about, no? how you relate to the world, how you relate to the others, and even how you position yourself within the actual the scenarios and the different layers that we are living or we are going through on a political level for health issues that are very much connected all together, aren't they? Yeah, and, and I think just now in a way it's like such an interesting time because we have those two things, right? One thing is this real opportunity perhaps to kind of take a step back and actually listen. Like you, you talk to so many people and they're quite a few projects even around this idea of listening, you know, what's, how do we suddenly perceive our outside world in this, uh, in this uh, moment of standstill? Um, and also like a, a more metaphorical sense of the word listening, like listening into to our lives, into ourselves, where we have this moment of stillness and, and perhaps use that to, to affect and contemplate change. Um, but at the same time, there's also this risk, I feel, since everything vibrant in the sense of uh, life, performance, concerts, interaction, mm -hmm. conversation, uh, vibrancy as like from person to person without the mediation of a screen has come to, to halt. Um, there's a risk of, of overload of the, of the visual and the, especially of the visual of the screen, right? There's so much content and, and everybody, you know, is watching their Netflix and their 1000 webinars and video calls and stuff like that. So that's almost kind of trying to push that, that opportunity to listen um, to the site. So, um, yeah, I, I think it was really a deliberate choice and uh, something important to both of us to hone in on that idea of listening. And uh, even though it's, it's 
definitely much more difficult. I feel for for the listener or for the audience to take this first step because it's a different commitment. For some, even though you're doing less, it's a different commitment to listen because you get distracted more easily. You have to focus more on a different way. Um, but once you've got the attention of the listener, I think it can be something much more powerful and profound. And also there is something that I want to go back, like kind of to the three pieces and to the act of listening. It's like kind of the music that has been chosen for each piece is very much connected with those issues raised. And it's like kind of, and they sound really different and there are different moods connected to that. I don't know if you want to, because we have spoken to you as a continent in terms of like kind of being like more connected with the old landscape, the uh, expedition sounds and this feeling of resting. But if you go to Queer Ray, then suddenly it's a completely different mood and the same with Lady Antigua. So I don't know if you want to go into that. So, yeah, I, I think again, um, one of the risks, obviously, of, of making uh, these kind of oral pieces, uh, one of the risks is that they end up sounding very similar, right? And that you kind of follow the same concept. So I think we've really tried to challenge ourselves to rethink the idea of that oral landscape that goes with the text from scratch every time and not fall back into, into the patterns we used in But I also, I knew that, that a part of having a quiet moment and a pause is not just this idea of healing that subcontinental proposes, this very soft, this softness and this tenderness. I also wanted it to be sexy. And I knew that Antarctica as a queer rave can be like, this memory of bodies dancing in a club, sweaty and just ecstatic, full of joy and full of celebration for being different, from, for being other. And I, we kind of thought, oh yeah, let's make this, let's have a drum solo, which David can just do perfectly. So we are also thinking about what do we have as a studio? We don't really have any other musicians anyway. So we have, we're thinking within our constraints, but we're thinking we want rhythm. We want to dance to this. We want somebody who doesn't even care about the sound or the meaning or what it's saying. I just want somebody to feel like they can celebrate whoever they are in that piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that definitely was a very different approach for Antarctica as a queer rave. I think that really it was more about the pace and the rhythm and and the energy, yeah. uh, so perhaps less about um, the kind of intellectual listening and the analysis, but more of the kind of visceral and bodily listening, and you, you kind of feel it. You don't have to actually pay attention to it. It's just something that comes to you uh, with the rhythm. So this piece is purely rhythmic, and it sort of um, plays with that idea of the digital and the analog, and uh, tries to recreate electronic dance music, but with acoustic instruments, and uh, I think works in that, uh, that space of tension a little bit. And uh, Lady Antigua, again, is completely different. And, um, and there I think we were mostly uh, inspired by the sort of sound we wanted, or by, the, by the musical context and by the choice of instruments, more specifically. Uh, where we sort, where we sort of use the, the church organ or the organ as a, as a in in the church context as a reference, uh, starting out with the, I mean it's much shorter the piece so um, and uh, so it has basically two parts and the first part um, uses that idea of um, the big. Uh, pipe organ which is in big cathedrals and uh, which sort of represent that idea of mostly the catholic but also other churches and as this big overpowering enterprise uh, and its connection in this specific context also to the colonial project uh, whereas the second part uh, uses the sound um, of uh, 
of the Hammond organ, uh, which is uh, basically one of the first portable organs uh, and much cheaper that small congregations uh, could use to make music for themselves and which in, in turn was really uh, had influence on a lot of popular music but it started there but it also allowed that music to be taken away from that big institute and as to to give that moment of yeah independence yeah. and liberation and empowerment to this small religious community and kind of sh shift that power dynamic. That's, I mean, and that goes back again no, to the democratization, what we were talking before. And that's, I think, something really interesting in connection about a political position that you are also um, kind of opening up in terms of authorship and how you've mentioned before the fact of healing and how an artist could act as a, med as a medium more than as an owner of the piece and what's the role that someone a listener could take in terms of embodying and kind of making of their own the pieces um i always uh, think of the connection between the word author and authority that it's important to remove the author from the authority and allow that those in-between moments for interpretation. Um, but definitely, I feel like part of a healing process right now, part of something that is medicinal, is artwork in general, is poetry. And um, it's sad. I, I just read an article right now that the UK took a poll and 70% of the people thought that the arts were on it inessential to life at the moment and that th that would be one of the first things they would give up and that is where i would insist that art is essential and that poetry is essential and it's in this moment of yeah viewer it's it's actually when i say we are opposite like that i don't mean we are opposite like that at all i'm talking about the non-binary binary and in many in many ways um it's an ironic statement. I and mean, at some level, I'm referring to the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I'm referring to the viewer and the, the work or the listener and the reader. But I'm actually saying that all of these lines are completely blurred. And there are entanglements that are far deeper. And also the non-human voice is the human voice. And the human voice is the non-human voice. The virus is us and we are the virus. So you know, it's, it's, I guess it's that. And, in the, and when, we, when we think of healing cultures and healing in general, we also think of what is the contamination and the contagion and what is the being. The antibody in a vaccine is in fact just a little bit of the disease inside you that is able to heal you. So opposites are not opposites at all. I don't know if that answered your question at all, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, it's really important to that, no? It's like kind of, is respecting the others, being human or not human, and kind of learning to live with the others. That that's something that we've been talking a lot about when we have been preparing the pieces, like how much we've been working with theories like Donna Harwin and Tim, that they were claiming for that, and how happy we were, like we've in those theoretical approaches, but now that we have to be face the actual challenge is like how we relate to the uh, virus, to the other being, you no, know, like kind of, and how we create that kind of those oppositions and how a piece could become like part of a dialogue and being an instrument you know, to kind of continue the conversation. And that's the value of the work of art. I would say. Yeah. yeah, and I also think, I mean, obviously it's ironic to say this in this context, right? But actually none of what we say really matters because the, the, all of these pieces, whatever we thought when we made them, whatever things we read, whatever theory came in, it actually should be completely irrelevant uh, to the listener or to the audience in the end. Uh, I feel... Mm, well, that's, that's a conversation I guess we have uh, quite often about uh, 
conceptual art and, and I always feel um, the concept has to be there and the concept has to be strong and the concept makes the work but the audience or the observer does not have to know the concept at all to appreciate the work and and I think it's just some sort of energy that that goes into it and that energy is there but it's sort of formless and it, it does not necessarily have to say anything in specific and it's it's the viewer that that perceives that energy and perhaps molds it in their own way and sees something completely different but still sees something because we've talked about this too that part of you know part of the part that i couldn't put in the research and links section is the embodiment is the research that takes place by being a body and all of the knowledge that enters you by listening to the goddesses or listening to the vibrations of the sound that you then record through an instrument um so hopefully within every piece there's many ways of knowing there's science there's anthropology there's religion there's spirituality but there's also all of these in between intuitional uh, ways that i don't want to name because naming it will immediately make it match um that hopefully you'd be able to enter into or feel in fact i was thinking like when i mean the stage is organized by topics and there are different topics different with the with different or kind of various kind of issues when we decided i mean this work would be kind of um archive or would live within the trailblazing into the unknown the reason why i mean on top of those ideas of healing it was like because it is really an open text that could be read in many ways no and that's something that it's what you were saying now like giving that possibility to everyone and that's that's really important and that's what we are trying to respect and also i would like to go back to something you have mentioned a few times and i think it's important it's like what does it mean like kind of we are opposite like that as a body of work because this is like kind of the last if we can ever say last because that gives a lot of weight to something but it's a process of almost four years that it's now kind of finishing because you are looking into other projects and how you see it like now looking backwards to that whole body of work that have videos, performance, the book itself, the audio chapters. Yeah, I found what Francesca said the other day to be very interesting, that she's noticed uh, artists and artworks producing the first of a series and the last of a series. And she said that the last always has this peculiar energy where you kind of empty your soul out because somehow it, it has a feeling of completion, even the completion is not possible. Um, and I like that because there was something, I think it was the trauma of everything that the world was going through, everything that we went through just at lockdown, but we poured our souls into it and we felt emptied at the end of each of the pieces because somehow it was also extending the medium of writing into sound into a soundscape but um it's been rewarding and i'm so lucky to have been able to work on one idea for four to five years it'll be five years by the time it's all done and that is a gift even though the two ideas i'm speaking about are a whole continent um, and a whole ocean but um yeah so it's the book was the initial idea and the book has just culminated and been printed and uh we've made two videos uh david scored the string quartet uh which we imagine as a performance as a silent film with a live string quartet and live poetry um, then there's other smaller pieces about a clairvoyant and me speaking through this clairvoyant, uh, her voice. Um, she was a clairvoyant used uh, by the British Empire in the Arctic, an Indian woman from Calcutta. Um, I've made 
performances, videos, the book now, and these sound pieces. And um, it's kind of amazing to have an interconnected body of work that can be also transmitted in its own way and hopefully have its own life. In the way that I was trying to give ICE a voice, that these pieces also can have their own lives. And I hope that they can also be, the work itself can't do too much work in the form of a campaign, but I do hope that they can do work peripherally for the cause of the Arctic and the Antarctic and for the cause of climate in general. But I almost never mention climate in any of these pieces. I was saying that I hope that, um, I was thinking that, you know, these are, my, these are the two poles. And I, I'm finishing my work on the polar regions. And I thought, what is my personal third pole? What is the third pole? And uh, it turns out that the Himalayas, which is what I'm named after, is technically called the third pole. I was amazed by that. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's the region of Tibet and such. Um, but it immediately drew me uh, in a visceral kind of way because I was like, I have done all of this ice research. There's still so much more to say about this amazing material that is compact. It releases heat when it's frozen. It, it has so many stories and it has so much light that it still kind of it dispenses and it has so much refraction, which means there's so many points of departure when it comes to ice. And ice also contains every element that I want to stay with it. So to come now to the Himalayas where we are right now, actually, and to start working on a mountain that has experienced a nuclear leak, as well as on animism and deities and ancestor worship, rituals that are not religious, but are celebrated over here, um, that also rethink our human connection to nature is what I'm moving on to next. That's also really, I mean, it's really important to me because I think it kind of follows a path. As you have said, like kind of that, connection now with the third pool that there is something you've mentioned and I think I, that now we were talking about something that has came to my mind like kind of this idea of art not being I mean being useless or not being relevant is like how much with these uh, with beauty or with different elements can be told and sometimes not directly with the environment and that not being talking about climate, about those things, but being underneath or underlying the whole process of work are, are important. I don't know how that fits or how you deal with that balance between kind of being obvious, being and the actual work of art that um, I tend to feel that if a work is overtly political or overtly or like too factual, but that's just me as a viewer, it kind of distances me a little bit. Um, but if, if it's like a code and I can be a detective, where I can uncode it and I'm allowed some agency in the work, as well as it um, stimulating different parts of me that I think when I, when I view a work of art, I don't really only want to think it, I want to feel it, I want to be moved. Part of my work is to work as an art critic. I write a lot of art and I try to ask myself every single time, even though you get so trained by the techniques of art criticism, to think only in, critical ways to think about composition, to think about um, structure, form, meaning, message. I try to think not, I, I try to not think about it and try to feel what, how do I, how is it, does it move me? How do I feel? Um, so I think that's important to me, but at the same time, I do feel like I love that we have a call to action right now uh, within the structure of the stage. 
and that we are able to cite an NGO that works closely in the Himalayas uh, with climate change, with women's empowerment. I think that's a beautiful way of not having the work to bear the burden of activism, but to be able to do things around it. One of the things with the Himalayan project that we want to do is actually transmit the music from the community radios so that it's more accessible, not only to artisans that we've been in contact with, but, but people, villagers who listen to the radio. Um, and music is something that they're, they're not going to have to be able to, you know, go to a museum to or have accessibility issues around. So those are the ways that I would like to think about uh, having to do things. Yeah. I, I think um, that, uh, yeah, that, that question about the futility of art and what does it change? Obviously, you know, you, you sort of are confronted with it once in a while. And it makes you think. But uh, I was just thinking when Molly was talking yesterday, we had a really uh, interesting uh, conversation. Incidentally, it was with a, uh, somebody from that, that NGO who was part of it to call for action, um, who we met so that, yesterday. So uh, Vanivi, no? That's the name of the organization. Yeah, Vanivi, yeah. And he's sort of the founder, and we met him yesterday for the first time and had a conversation about love. Uh, and it was about the the futility actually of love as the concept. It's it's so futile, and the connection between love and and creativity, and uh, how creativity is almost like in my mind an act of love, and it's incredibly futile from the outside. It doesn't really lead anywhere. But in the end of the day, it's one of the like love, one of the most powerful things there are, and which really allow us to move mountains uh, like nothing else does. Um, so yeah, that's just my two cents about that. Yeah, I think a lot of the work that we and I make have to do with love being a force of attraction. So often in the book that I described where I said, oh, it's just it's a kind of messy collection of all of these ideas, I hold that it's held together by love that love is an attractive force that can hold disparate narratives together. Uh, Calvino in, in, the, in Six Memos for the Next Millennium has a whole passage about a ring that was cursed and each character that had the ring fell in love with, uh, so every, any character fell in love with anybody else who owned the ring. So at the end of the story, the king Charlemagne throws the ring into the lake because he says this is a cursed ring and he falls in love with the lake. And I love that the idea was that the ring could go, it could go up to the sky, it could go to a lake, it could go to a little peasant girl, it could go to a king. But they were all, held, all of these stories were held together by the ring, which was a close circle of love. Following that thread is really nice with the idea, really interesting in connection to the idea of embodiment, empowerment, listening, that we have been dealing throughout, or even the project you were mentioning about the Himalaya, the goddess, and different kind of knowledges, because there is something that kind of um, is underneath the whole practice, I would say, and this maybe it's my assumption as curator or producer or whatever, but it's the fact that there is a challenging of traditional knowledge, that knowledge that has been defined or predefined by modernity, where there is a kind of the patriarchy of these men, a very determined type of men that has defined what knowledge is, what science is, what are the relationships we have with the body through a science that like it's medicine and it's kind of really connected to a scientific knowledge. And I guess that through every single step of this conversation, through every step in your work, you are questioning those types of official knowledge, you know, and opening up new ways of connecting, relating, behaving, and learning and experiencing in the end. And that's something that really goes back to the power of art as opening windows to new ways of 
looking into history. And I think it goes back to the power of being outside, going on expeditions, on walking. You realize that rational observation will only take you so far. That so much of the book uh, stops at the point where the ship's navigation doesn't work anymore. And it looks up at the North Star and it asks it, guide me. I have only last one question, I think, and it's connected with the podcast. That it's, uh, this is this piece that it's meant to be done by a journalist as a reaction or as a way of giving context to the piece. In this case, we have worked with, um, uh, with Sky and Daddy Thomas, and it's been like kind of something that has been chosen by you in terms of like, you wanted the input of, of Sky, and it's been a very interesting, and um, people will be able to listen to the podcast, which I think it's a really nice, kind of um, response or conversation or dialogue with the actual piece. I don't know if you want to tell a bit more about that decision, why working with Sky and what were the things that you were willing to or expecting, no? Like sometimes we project when we invite someone. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been reading some of Sky's more recent political work. She's been linking imagery and the visual environment to the politics of the country. I knew that she's from here, so she's going to be able to um, understand and transmit some particularities of South Asia. And uh, she's very much within a queer community that gets what being other means. Um, so for Anne, and I enjoy her writing. So I invited her um, technically to do a podcast, maybe thinking about this work in particular, but I love that she and um, I think Mario in collaboration with her were able to do exactly to the text what I wanted my listeners to do, which was imagine other futures, take it elsewhere. In, the, in their case, they invited three or four other artists to uh, have readings or respond within their work to the idea of land, to the idea of queerity um, and otherness. And, um, and wo they wove in, they wove in so many of the ideas that the three, these three pieces look at, but through other lenses. And as I began out saying that subcontinent is really an open text that invites other voices, that to, to be in the company of so many other voices, to be a kind of jungle of otherness is, um, I think it's a very appropriate response. So I hope that people connect to it and enjoy and, and discover new artists as well in the bargain. Do you think, is there anything missing or something you would like to add to the conversation? I, I mean, I just think that um, working with you was a very special experience because we, we would just have conversations about life and, you know, thinking about the root of curator as a caretaker in some way is perhaps becoming also really important right now where what does the what does the artist and curator or the artist and institution become in a time like this can we be friends can we be family how do we create entanglements I and mean, embodiments of the kind that we're talking about conceptually but how do we do that in a systematic way so and we know that art institutions have you know, responsibilities and artists have responsibilities in terms of representation and in terms of uh, working from within. But I do appreciate how TBA and I work together in a fair way, incorporating a collaboration with David. And also, uh, you know, I didn't feel the pressure of time in that way. And these things are really important to also feel that this is the moment, this is the energy we're in. Um, so that was just the last thing, you know, to think about the institution of art and, um, and yeah, perhaps to think, to like spin this a bit further, to think about the creative process also as an ecosystem. It's like not 
it, it, it like, as we mentioned several times in this conversation, right, how all these different waves come through these historical moments, the things you read, the conversations you have with other people, the media that are at your disposal, the collaborators, the, it's, it's so many things, but, but that's what makes it so interesting as well, right? And that, that podcast perhaps also reflects that. It's like this overspilling ecosystem of like connections and something goes there and something goes there. And I mean, that anyhow, I think is very much Himali where there's never like a straight line <laughs> at all. <laughs> Like there. Um, uh, Says the German to the Indian. <laughs> Here we have presenting you linear time and digression. <laughs> and also other ways of doing. No? That's something like we have to challenge theory and we have to try to. I mean, it's really complicated because sometimes we have. I mean, it's like the parameters, the, fa the frame we've learned within, but it's really difficult to detach yourself from. But you will have to challenge that. And as we are challenging with the pieces, we have to do it with the behavior as well, no? I would say even beyond challenging theory would be just to practice theory. Oh. <laughs>